Hi, this is Dr. Peggy Simmingson. And I'm Dr. John Smith. And we're in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Texas at Arlington. And our topic today is the idea of a comprehensive approach to elementary literacy instruction. And Dr. Smith, can you tell me a bit about your teaching background? Sure. Uh, I began as a second grade teacher back in the olden days. I did that for three years, and then I taught fifth grade. And then for five years, I was a Title I remedial reading teacher, where I taught students in kindergarten through grade six who were below grade level and struggling to catch up in reading. And then um, after that, I moved to Utah State University and for 20 years was a reading professor. And maybe the highlight of that time was when I took a year off and went back and taught first grade. I really wanted the opportunity of getting kids fresh out of kindergarten and teaching them to read. And that was a wonderful time for me. Okay, great. You went back to the classroom. How would you describe a comprehensive, the comprehensive approach to elementary literacy instruction? Sure. I think we've all heard of the reading wars. For decades, we've had the phonics versus whole language debate going on. And then uh, I believe it was the early 2000s, the idea of balanced literacy became popular, but for just a very short time. And that gave way, I think, to the idea of comprehensive literacy instruction. And I like that term much better because it describes not just balancing this versus that, but actually all of the things that are needed for young children to learn to read effectively. And based on what I had read in the research, based on my own teaching experience, and especially based on that year of going back to first grade, I came up with five things that I think students need every day. And I like to think of it as a framework because there are many different ways to teach phonics or many different ways to do guided reading or writing workshop. But the point is, I think there are five basic things that every student needs every day. And exactly how you do them is maybe less important as long as they get done. And the first thing I used to do was reading aloud to my students. And sometimes it would be a picture book that we would read all in one sitting but then often I would do two read-alouds a day, and I would read a chapter out of a chapter book. And uh, I could go on and on about the importance of both of those and what they contribute in terms of vocabulary and attitude and emotional attachment to books. But reading aloud to them every day, sometimes multiple times every day, is critically important. And then the second thing that they need every day is word identification instruction. Typically, we think of phonics or word attack, and also recognizing common irregularly spelled words that they wouldn't be able to sound out. And in teaching phonics, again, by looking at state curricula, looking at reading research articles, textbooks, many, many different sources, I wanted to simplify the phonics instruction as much as I could to make it accessible to six and seven year olds. And so I identified um, seven or eight very common spelling patterns. And so we started out the year with what we called beginner words, C-A-T, B-A-T, S-I-T, three letter C-V-C words. And it took us a couple of months to really get that down solid with all of my first graders. Because they have to know the letter sound, they have to understand the phonemic awareness relationships and be able to mix and match the letter sounds. But uh, once they got pretty good at that, then I would move them on to consonant blends. Because if they could blend F-A-T, it was not that much harder to blend F-A-S-T or F-L-A-T. And so the blends came very, very quickly. And then we moved to consonant digraphs, T-H-S-H-C-H-W-H where with TH you don't hear a T sound or an H sound. You hear two other sounds, th or th. And they just simply had to memorize that, that those two consonants together make a different sound. I think of the alphabet. We have 26 letters, but in English we have 44 spoken speech sounds, which leaves 18 sounds without a letter. 
And so how do we do that? Well, many letters make more than one sound, or combinations of letters make some of those sounds. And that's what those consonant digraphs are, just pairs of letters to make some of those additional sounds. And then from the consonant digraphs, we moved to vowels. And we started with the final silent E spelling pattern. And we called those tickle words. Mm -hmm. And one day I was standing at the board, and they're all sitting on the carpet up front of me. And I said, OK, here's the word SAM, S-A-M. And they got all excited. Oh, Mr. Smith, that's a beginner word, SAM. That's easy. And I said, OK, if we put the E on the end, this is what happens. That E reaches over that little M, letter M, tickles that short A, and makes it say its name. Ah! And I just kind of screamed out, ah, and all the kids, oh! <laughs> and then it became a lot of fun for them to find and decode tickle words. Mm. And then we moved to vowel teams, OA and EA and AI, those kind of things. The, you know, we used to always say, when two vowels go walking, the first does the talking. Well, that's um, that pattern. But I picked out just six occurrences where it's very consistent, very common, and those are the ones I taught them. I just, again, wanted to keep it simple, didn't want to overload them, especially with a bunch of patterns that they would hardly ever, ever see. And then from that, we launched into the R-controlled vowels, another common spelling pattern. And then we went to vowel diphthongs, and then we went to some uh, common chunks like IGHT, things they just have to recognize. And when we were doing this phonics, uh, there was a three-step procedure I went through with each pattern. The first was to provide some direct instruction. And I would have word lists that contained these patterns written on chart paper. And I would read the words to them, and we'd read them together. And, and then we started playing games with them. I'd say silly things like, well, you're doing pretty good reading from top to bottom. When you get to be in the fifth grade, you can start at the bottom of the chart and read them. Oh, we can do that now, Mr. Smith! <laughs> And, uh, and of course they would. And then we did all sorts of flashcard games. And then the third step for each spelling pattern was to find it in print. And so we had charts all over the classroom walls and we would circle or underline the spelling patterns that they found. In their stories that they read during guided reading, we would find those very same spelling patterns. Uh, I would take some of their stories and put them on overhead transparencies and flash them up on the screen and the kids would come up to the board and underline circle the spelling patterns. And so our entire room became just a collection of spelling patterns in different configurations. And it was those same simple patterns that I went through. And so that phonics part became game-like, it became simple, it became fun. I was not having them memorize rules. It was just some simple, basic spelling patterns. And it worked very, very well for them. That's great. I liked how you integrated spelling and phonics and writing and reading all mm -hmm. together. Yes. And then after the phonics part of the morning, and I would say also that every day we did a complete three-hour literacy block. And that was heavenly and wonderful and effective. But then we launched into our guided reading. And often it was fairy tales, often it was leveled books, it was different kinds of things. And, uh, and while I would be working with one group, the other groups were doing centers, and many of them were doing, that was a good time for their silent reading instruction, which is actually the fourth component. Uh, and so guided reading is where you can zero in on books at their level, give them things at their instructional level to read. In those guiding re guided reading groups, we typically would start out with going over sight words, irregularly spelled words, and keep track of how many of them they had learned and who needed how many and what level they were at. And then we would introduce a story at their level and often do a picture walk to help build comprehension, talk about the context, and then we would read through it. And this was a great time to talk about vocabulary, picking out some of the really good words. And I would say also those early morning read-alouds were probably the best time to focus on vocabulary because children's literature is full of so many wonderful vocabulary words 
that they would be using all the time in their regular speech. And then, you know, back to the guided reading groups. So we would do sight words. We would do a, you know, guided reading of a story that they were on. And then we often would finish up with fluency, something that we could read over and over. Um, and I used to say, until you can make it sound like talking. Mm -hmm. And uh, so three components during the guided reading time. And again, the center, sometimes, again, silent reading or playing with letter cards, building words, doing mix and match things, um, having charts on the walls that they would do activities with. And then again, the fourth component is silent reading. And the last component was writing workshop. And in a lot of ways, that was the highlight of the morning. Um, I would have them self-select the topics, and so they wanted to write about their dogs and their grandmas and their sleepovers, and I banned the Nintendo stories. Mm -hmm. I said, you guys are the authors. I'm the editor. I am not publishing any Nintendo stories, so don't even start. Uh, I wanted things that they could take home and their parents would be proud of and that they would keep as mementos of those childhood years. But uh, I started writing workshop um, with a mini lesson. And again, this is the olden days. I used overhead transparencies. But uh, maybe I would be teaching them about detail. So we would look around the room and we would find details and uh, we would have this class story that just went on and on. I would use their names, but I would write um, things about our classroom or out on the playground, things that they noticed, things that they would see, and I'd fill it up with details, and I would just model in that mini lesson how to add details to the story. And so they're on the carpet, and I'm writing, Chris saw Mr. Smith's guitar case. He wanted to open it. Sally said, no, don't touch that, and uh, just using their names. And as I'm writing, they're looking up on the screen, they're reading the words, trying to figure out what they are before I finish them even. So it became like mm -hmm. shared reading. Mm -hmm. I remember doing revision. I wrote the sentence on the overhead, Sam went to the store. And I said, that's got to be the most boring sentence there ever was. <laughs> We've got to add some details. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, tell us about Sam. What did he look like? Why did he go to the store? What did he do when he was at the store? What did he buy at the store? How did he get home? And pretty soon that little sentence was just filled up a whole page with details. So I'd start each writer's workshop day with a mini lesson. And that took, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. And that was where I was teaching them, modeling for them how to do things that good writers do. And then I sent them back to their seats, and they each had a writing folder full of blank writing paper, and they got to work. They wanted to write about their dogs and grandmas and sleepovers and vacations, and they loved doing that. And while they were writing, I would go desk to desk to desk to do individual writing conferences. And I'd say, tell me what you're writing about. Read it to me. And I would give them feedback. And usually I'd give them feedback on the content of their story. I want to know more about Grandma. What does she look like? What did Grandma say the last time you were over there? And then I would also give them feedback about mechanics. You know, you've got a whole page here, and it's all one sentence. I think we need to work on that. So let's, you know, where would be a good place to stop and put a period and a capital letter? And let's make three sentences out of this. And so again, feedback on content, feedback on mechanics. And that took a good 30, 35 minutes every morning. They're writing, I'm doing the conferences. I had a little first grade chair and I'd drag it around with me desk to desk to desk doing these conferences. And then we would finish the morning with writers or with the author's chair. Mm -hmm. And as I was doing the conferences, I would note which students really had a big chunk of new text they hadn't read to the group before. And I, would, and I had a sign on my chalkboard that said author's chair. And I'd say, would you go write your name under the author's chair sign? And so every day, three or four names went up for author's chair. And uh, when the writing, drafting part was done, um, I would say, okay, we've got three people today who are going to read in the author's chair. And I had this big overstuffed chair I bought at the Goodwill store that was our author's chair. And they would sit, excuse me, sit there, read their drafts to the class. And I said to the students, now as you listen, I want you to think of two things. What did you like 
that you can tell the authors? And what would you add that you can tell the authors? So our authors chair students got feedback from their peers and then the next day they would incorporate those things into their drafts. And then of course the thing that made the writing workshop work was the publishing. And when they thought that they had a story finished and were ready to publish, they'd say, hey, Mr. Smith, can we have a, a conference about this? And I told them early on, can you make a book out of one page of writing? And they had to think about this, and they decided, no, you couldn't. And I said, no, we've got to have about 10 pages to make a book. And, uh, and actually, the manuscripts became much longer than that because at one point in the fall, one of the students decided to write a chapter book. And so as soon as Alex sat in the chair and read his chapter book, chapter one and chapter two, they all wanted to do chapter oh, books, amazing. and the drafts yeah. immediately got much longer. But, they uh, inspire each <clears throat> other. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, so when their drafts were finished, we both agreed it was ready to be published, I would typeset it, and uh, Half the, I'd give them a half sheet of paper with their text at the bottom, and they would illustrate the top part. And when all of the illustrating was done, then I took it to the teacher workroom, made photocopies, and then I bound it, spiral binding on the side, laminated front page, back page. And uh, I would give them the original copy for their personal, you know, take it home. And then the photocopy went into the classroom library, and they enjoyed reading each other's books. Um, and the back of the book, each book, we had the author's page, the author information page. And I had a little template, you know, so-and-so is a first grade student at Wilson Elementary School, so-and-so is very good at, and the kids would add in things they were good at, and so-and-so likes, and they would add in things that they like to do. And then I always finished up by so-and-so loves his family or her family. And uh, so I had an author information template for each student that went on the as the back page of the book. Mm -hmm. And what I found is that all five of those components worked so well together. They were necessary. The spelling pattern stuff that we studied during the word identification became very helpful to them as they were writing. The vocabulary that we did from the read-alouds would show up in their writing. The writing gave them more practice because reading and writing are the same thing, the spelling patterns, it's recognizing spelling patterns or producing the same spelling patterns that complemented each other. So all of these parts worked hand in glove and when you put it all together you do have a comprehensive reading instruction program that does work very effectively for the students. That's great. That's, that's what a lot. you get. You ask one little question and the professor gets oh, started and doesn't stop. And I'll share these um, resources can, I heard a lot of scaffolding and support and structure in there, um, and also motivation. So I think that's important. Um, that you know, literacy is something you want the students to model for one another, not just coming from the teacher. So that's yes. good. And again, the the read aloud was the motivating part. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how much time you have on this thing, but I remember. I would go to the local library with a cardboard box and then go into the back to the I Can Read section and check out about 25 at a time. Mm -hmm. Bring them back to my class and I'd do like a 15 second book talk on each one mm -hmm. and be thinking which one you want and uh, I would lay them gently out on the carpet in the middle and I would say, okay, now don't hurt the books, ready, go, and they'd all go grab the one that they wanted and, and then exchange them around. But again, all those parts working very well together. That's great. I like that. Do you have any other tips for new teachers in terms of elementary literacy? Um, one of the other thing I hadn't mentioned was do individual reading conferences. That I would try to find time each day to have one or two of the students come to my desk, bring the, you know, the library book, the silent reading book that they had in their desk, and I would say, why did you choose this book? And the student would tell me, well, Alex said it would be a really good book to read, or I saw so-and-so reading it and I was interested, or I like books about this topic. And I have a notebook, so I'm taking notes on what topics each student likes to read about. 
in their interest and their attitudes toward reading. And then I'd say, okay, read a couple of paragraphs to me. And they would read, and I'm making notes on words that they struggled with or misread or their fluency, but other aspects of their oral reading. And then the third thing was to give them some guidance. I might help them with some of these difficult words. Or I might say, here are some other books by that same author. You really ought to check those out. And I think you would like them. Or some other books on this same topic that you would really like. But I kept a, you know, a class reading log of what they all liked, what individual words they might struggle with, or patterns they were struggling with, and advice and assignments that I gave them. And so each time I did a reading conference, I'd look back at the previous notes from the last reading conference and try to pick up and carry on. That's so great. that was something else. Teachers are always documenting everything, so that's good to know. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Smith, and I'll um, put some resources on Can this I say video. one more thing? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, especially for new teachers, I would highly recommend joining the International Reading Association and getting a subscription to the reading teacher. Oh, good advice. It is a wonderful journal that is a nice balance between research and reading and what classroom teachers can actually do. And they actually have a special mm -hmm. section on classroom teaching tips. And so you yeah. really do want to start getting professional journals. And I would start with the reading teacher. Yeah, good advice. And the website is uh, reading.org for IRA, International Reading Association.